Hi there, it's a beautiful uh, snowy day here in uh, Holland. Uh, it's really amazing because we have about 20 centimeters uh, snow, which is very unusual. Uh, and I might uh, link uh, or put a little bit of imagery uh, behind this video just of my street where cars are sliding around. Really funny. All these uh, people are not used to drive in the snow and they're just trying it and it's not very good for their cars. Uh, and I won't cry about it. Uh, what I decided is to keep focused on the agorocentric uh, information and model and theory uh, and the websites related to it because I think it can really become an, uh, well, an interesting uh, constellation of uh, functionalities that all have to do with being autonomous, self-reliant, uh, not uh, isolated, but simply not being a burden on, uh, on neighboring communities, not having the Keynesian economic model where everybody depends on everybody uh, for everything, all the time. Uh, quite the opposite, actually. And the reason why it's not a very favorite uh, uh, system right now is because the Trinity, the the banks, the industry companies, or the, the consumer industry, the banks and the energy companies, uh, the Trinity is operating to supply a lot of things to everybody and make a lot of money off of it, get rich off it. And because they basically de de they developed a system just like Monsanto develops a seed system or a fertilization system with different components where you have a seed and uh, that's, that's manipulated and then you have a fertilizer and. Uh, your herbicide, pesticides, all that stuff, and the whole farming method. Society is a system where you have the Trinity that produces everything and has the banking system and energy companies, and then you have the consumer that basically has to sit back, uh, do some job in the Trinity, uh, and, uh, and consume oil and be happy about that. And of course, many people are happy about that, there's nothing wrong with it. The only problem uh, is that it will. Uh, go away because there will be the end of cheap oil pretty soon. And um, the end of cheap oil means that uh, a lot of things that are now, uh, a lot of this uh, system that is now working will simply not function anymore. Uh, and, and that I think is very, and because the Trinity profits from the current situation and profits from the dependencies and profits from this system that they devised, they have a choice. They can go on profiting from it, or they can stop profiting and, and then have a sudden death, uh, basically. Or they can stop profiting today and start preparing everybody for a different system. Um, and they don't want to do that. They just don't want to uh, help in the transition. They don't see that as a viable thing to do. Uh, and that's why I think it's important to talk about this agrocentrism where you are uh, self-reliant and you know uh, what your local community can uh, can yield. It's different from, uh, it's not, let's say, it's not, it's similar to, uh, you know, uh, these uh, intentional communities and all that stuff, but it is different in the sense that it tries to look at the current situation as it actually is and tries to change it only marginally. In or uh, in, let's say uh, as much as little as possible in order to achieve this autonomy. Uh, so it's actually about not trying to start all over again. It's trying to continue, but uh, making sure that you're you know you cut off every dependency that you have that you don't absolutely need. And I can tell you, you don't need to be dependent at all. There's a remark uh, on my previous video which I think is, uh, it might be interesting to address and that's somebody saying, well we have uh, 6.8 million people, we all need the oil to grow our food and, uh, and if the oil stops then we're just done. And uh, one of the other people that says that is Michael Rupert. Now the fact is that it's been researched that uh, land, if you farm it intensively, is not more productive than land if you farm it organically. That's a very important thing to realize, it's, and it's really true, it's being researched, it's being tested, and etc. Actually several times. How productive is organic farming? It is as productive as intensive farming. Why the hell do we have intensive farming then? Well, simple, people make money off of it. And it is very well organized and regimented and, and efficient. Uh, so that produce can be harvested automatically and be uh, processed and be put into, let's say, the whole chain of the, let's say, the, the system that's been designed by the Trinity 
uh, in order to uh, serve the, the consumer. It's so all done for the good, it's just going to be obsolete. Uh, and that's the big benefit of intensive farming. You know, it's of course ridiculous that a farm that produces food that feeds 100.000 uh, people or something like that, if it's a huge farm, that these farmers are usually not making a lot of money. They're not rich. Because they're burdened by all kinds of uh, things that have been put into this chain that are not actually ne necessary to, to do what you're doing, which is feeding people. So that's my answer to the person that says it's a big calamity. Uh, let's say that's the first part. The second part of my answer is, yes, you have a problem with uh, the end of cheap oil and farming because the land, as it's being used right now, is not alive. Uh, so if you study the subject, you discover that farms, intensive farms, the land is dead. And it gets everything it needs to grow the plants that you put on it. But if you don't put any fertilizer in it and, and all the other stuff, then nothing happens anymore, because the land is dead. And in order to have organic farming, you need to have land or soil that is alive. Because uh, a very good analogy, I think, if, for soil is that it's basically a battery. You can charge it, and then you can uh, discharge it into uh, whatever you want to eat in crops, in trees, and whatever grows on it. But you have to charge it first with chemicals. And basically what happens is that if the right plants grow on it, it inhales, uh, let's say, uh, nitrogen and carbon dioxide, and it carbon is stored in the ground, the ground gets darker, uh, nitrogen is stored in the ground, in the, in the fungal uh, network that you have, and it all starts to live, and it all starts to, uh, let's say, communicate and cooperate and, and share the minerals, and, and everything flows around, it's like tissue. And if you have a soil like that, it will constantly inhale nitrogen from the atmosphere and it will constantly be able to yield uh, something that you plant on it, like a courgette or whatever it is. And so the second part of the answer is that yes, you have a huge problem post-petrol, post-cheap oil, because you, have, you need about five years for the ground, for the soil, to revive, to relive. And then it doesn't, might not even happen just like that, because one of the biggest myths is of course that life comes back if you give it a chance. Sometimes it just doesn't. And sometimes the, the situation you have created is simply not inviting and conducing to life. Or sometimes the life is simply gone and it cannot come back because it doesn't exist anymore. That's a big problem. And that's, I think, an important one to, uh, to also uh, kind of uh, alert others to, is that it's not that you cannot grow the food, it is that the soil is dead when the oil is, is gone and you're stuck there. Of course there's many other aspects of it which have to do with this agorocentric approach and that is that you have to live closer to the land because you're not going to be having massive ability to transport and have all these logistics anymore. You might have it in the future, electrical, with solar power or whatever, but in the initial phase you won't. And that's, how you, that's why you have to reorient it to, to land. So that's my answer to, my previous, uh, to the, previous, uh, the comment on the previous video. I'll keep it at this uh, today and I hope you have a very nice Saturday evening with lots of Christmas dinners. And, uh, and uh, talk to you.